Welcome back, YouTube gamers, to my second video where I will discuss AD&D 2nd Edition, talk about its strengths and weaknesses, and evaluate its impact on fantasy gaming. 2nd Edition AD&D was released in 1989. The three core rule books, the Monster Manual, Player's Handbook, and Dungeon Master's Guide, were all completely reorganized with updated material, and this time only one month apart. While some can say that the changes contained therein are a vast improvement over the first edition of the rules, with some even claiming that this is the best edition of the game, I will have to fundamentally disagree. Yes, second edition brought the player's handbook, Unearthed Arcana, and their survival guides into a single tome, reorganized everything so that it was now a cohesive whole, made Thaco a standard game mechanic, streamlined initiative, and fixed many problems with individual spells. Yet, it still failed to address some of the fundamental flaws of the game. In my mind, this was really a major blunder for TSR, and probably one of my biggest disappointments with the new edition. At the time, I didn't think of it like this, but as I look back with older and wiser eyes, it's quite clear that second edition failed to innovate. It failed to do something spectacular. First edition AD&D literally created a whole new type of entertainment, the effect of which reverberates to this day to people who have never even picked up a D20 uh, with such computer games uh, like World of Warcraft, EverQuest, and a mirrored list of other computer role-playing games. Third edition uh, eventually would completely reawaken what some thought was a dying industry with its open gaming license and progressive tweaking of long-standing D&D rules such as armor class and skills. Second edition AD&D didn't really offer anything new. To those uh, of us who were long-time players, what second edition represented was better organization and the integration of the best homebrew home rule editions that were, most of us were using already. Um, now, at the time, I'm going to admit I, I loved it. It was new and shiny and had high production values, great artwork, and not having to reference multiple books to find a, a specific rule or a resource was a vast improvement. Um, and I've seen other reviewers talk about this as well. I mean, well, when you went from first to second edition, there wasn't even a thought about it. I mean, you just went out and got it. That's uh, another reviewer uh, that I like. He, he said the exact same thing that I was thinking. I mean, you, there wasn't even a thought about not getting second edition. You just did it because it was Dungeons & Dragons. Um, now, that's not to say that TSR itself wasn't doing innovative things. The only reason that AD&D uh, survived this era and continued to generate massive revenue for TSR, in my opinion, was name brand recognition. And some of the best RPG producers in the industry, such as uh, Aaron Alston, Ed Greenwood, Peter Atkinson, and Monty Cook, were all on TSR's payroll. And they allowed the company to offer some of the most intriguing supplements ever produced for a role-playing game. Some of the gems put out during the 1990s that are considered classics include such things as the Waterdeep box set and the wonderfully unique supplement to go with it, Volo's Guide to Waterdeep. Uh, and I'm going to pause here for a second with Volo's Guide. Uh, if you don't have this book and you like to run a city campaign, you need this book. Uh, this book is just awesome. Even if you don't use Waterdeep, uh, it, it's going to give you an understanding of how to actually add some life into your city. And it's a fun read. It's just a fun read. It's very rare that you find a, a supplement that is just this much fun to go through and, uh, and just uh, laugh, laugh at it to yourself while you're reading it. It's a great book, um, and I'm probably going to have to dedicate a video just to Volo's Guide to Waterdeep. But anyway, um, the Menzo Baranzan box set was also released. Uh, the Ravenloft box set. Spelljammer, Planescape, uh, the underrated but excellent Birthright series, and of course the monumental Ruins of Undermountain box set. Yeah, the game system might have been lacking with incongruities and problems in the rules themselves, but these supplements of the game offered endless hours of enjoyment and are still much beloved by many players to this day. That's all well and good, Captain Courageous, but what's the problem with AD&D 2nd Edition anyway? you might ask. Well, first of all, the incongruity of tactile and systems was basically pulled whole cloth from the first edition uh, of the game. Now, I talked about that in my previous video, so if you haven't seen that, 
uh, you might want to uh, reverse and go and check out my the my first video uh, that I did on uh, first edition Dungeons and Dragons to figure out what I'm talking about here. But the core mechanic for non-weapon proficiencies, which AD&D calls skills, uh, was basically left unchanged. Roll the core ability score or less to succeed. Meanwhile, the now renamed Rogue still used percentile dice for skill resolution. Now, I know there are a lot of people out there that love second edition. As I said, there are a lot of great supplements for this edition. And yes, it's surely easier to simply use the game system that goes with them. But when you look at it critically, the incongruities are rather difficult to ignore. And let me just give you an example here, and I'll talk about rogue non-weapon proficiencies, uh, like reading lips, typewrite walking, tumbling. Uh, these are skills whose usefulness is on par with rogue core class abilities, such as listening, moving silently, and picking pockets. Yet, look at the starting chances for a rogue to do their core class abilities versus the starting chances for anyone, really, because you could, anyone could pick up a non, these non-weapon proficiencies uh, for an extra, extra proficiency slot. So, um, let's say I'm a halfling rogue, and I have an 18 dex, uh, and I want to pick pockets. My chance of success is 50%. But my chance of successfully tumbling, whether I'm a rogue of any class, really, uh, and if I'm dressed appropriately with no penalties, and I have an 18 dex, it's 90%. That's insane. <laughs> I mean, here, look, at the pro look at all the problems that you have to go through when you're, a, when you're a thief. You start at first level and your skills are basically useless. Your chances of success are so small uh, compared to when you get to 10th level when you actually finally start to become useful. Uh, but, you can, but your non-weapon proficiencies at first level are immediately fundamentally awesome. That's, that, just, that incongruity uh, doesn't make any sense. And uh, the problem with AD&D was that it was still an amalgam of various resolution subsystems cobbled together into one game, many of which did the same thing or accomplished the same thing differently as other systems in the game. And while second edition characters were certainly more customizable than their first edition counterparts compared to other systems out of the time, such as Rollmaster, RuneQuest, GURPS, the generic universal role-playing game, and HeroQuest, they were still quite limited. The most glaring problem with second edition is its lack of cohesion. Now, many players will point out that this might be one of the reasons they liked it, because the game was a bit of a mess. That was its appeal. Uh, just like with first edition AD&D, it encouraged clever DMs to craft their own systems and use those in place of core mechanics. I did this myself. I mean, obviously you can tell that I did not like the non-weapon proficiencies as written. So what I did is I basically created an ability score chart which gave you pluses or minuses depending on your ability. And then you would roll a d20 and add your bonus. And if you exceeded, uh, if you um, rolled higher than the difficulty number that I set for what you were trying to accomplish, you succeeded. Does that sound familiar? Well, don't worry. I'm not trying to take credit for the third edition skill system. But to be honest, Wizards of the Coast can't either. Now, I'm sure they'll claim differently, uh, but we were all doing that. I mean, pretty much as things progressed, if you went to a convention or you, uh, you know, when, when the Internet came out, you looked online at what people were doing, that's basically what they had done. They had redone the proficiency system and changed it. into Because difficult, the difficulty number system, uh, Star Wars role-playing game from West End Ga Games uh, had... had done a difficulty number system. There were a lot of role-playing games out there that had uh, created that, that uh, game mechanic of uh, rolling a skill or higher to, create, to beat a difficulty number. So that's not anything new. That wasn't anything that wasn't there before. Uh, so was, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, when they went into third edition, they integrated that system into the rolling of a d20, which makes complete and total sense. Um, but that's, that's where, where, where I'm looking at with, with second edition. Things that should have been done with second edition uh, were not done. And basically, it was kind of lazy. It's really lazy when you look at it. They basically they didn't really do too much, that much different from first edition, uh, except put it all into one book where, so you didn't have to look at all these different books. Um, now, the problem with, with, with creating systems for the game is that a lot of DMs are not quite as clever as maybe they think they are, and uh, execution is poor. And they're introducing new players to the game, and these players play this game, and they're like, what the heck is going on here? I don't like this game. Um, and so they either don't continue to uh, in the role-playing hobby, or they move on to a different game. And, and that's really what, what you would find at that, at that time, is I used to play D&D, but now I play this. So you would get, uh, Dungeons & Dragons was the gateway into the hobby, 
and then you moved on to something better. That doesn't make any sense. You know, that, that, that's a problem. Um, and let's, let's look at it, um, the second edition Dungeon Master's Guide, another problem I have. Uh, when you look at a comprehensive work like the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide, this book is simply oozing with relevant and inspirational advice and information for Dungeon Master's from cover to cover. I mean, just the appendix of the Dungeon Master's Guide is a s treasure trove of cool stuff. Um, the second edition Dungeon Master's Guide is a total disgrace. There are really no articles of value for beginning DMs, and quite frankly, for something that is supposed to be a core rule book, it's a totally optional book. Uh, the combat system is included in the second edition player's handbook. So if you were an experienced DM and you knew about tricks and traps and uh, you had the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide, you could just skip it. Uh, you, there's no reason to buy the thing. And really, guys, think about that. This is supposed to be a core rule book, and you don't need it. Um, but let's talk about character customization with second edition, uh, or lack thereof, which was still pulled whole cloth from first edition. Uh, yeah, you now had uh, non-weapon proficiencies, but I already went into the problem with that skill system. It didn't make any sense. But you could still customize your character a little bit with some skills that you couldn't do in first edition, but that wasn't really superior. Uh, that You still had problems with one, if you wanted to do other things. Uh, what TSR did was to release a series of thick handbooks for each class, uh, and these offered character kits that could be tacked onto the base class to allow a player to customize and make their character unique. Some of these kits were interesting and offered very enticing options for players. Uh, but this also introduced more statistic creep and needless crunch to the game system. Not to mention the massive addition to the sheer number of reference books needed to play the game. The complete fighter's handbook, the complete cleric's handbook, the complete rogue's handbook, the complete wizard's handbook, the complete bard's handbook, the complete paladin's handbook. And handbooks for all the races, elves, half-elves, uh, dwarves, halflings, half-orcs, as, as well as some other books, the complete ninja's handbook. I mean, it was insane. So what you now have is a game system that is a massive lumbering hawk. Can you imagine being the Dungeon Master's Guide and carrying all these books? I had a milk crate with all my second edition books in it So I, when, I, when I wasn't uh, Dungeon Mastering at my house. Uh, sadly, however, TSR's failure to innovate while trying to emulate the success of other game companies, such as Wizards of the Coast with their Magic the Gathering collectible card game, that really put the nail on the company's coffin. Uh, and let me tell you how that worked out. Um, in 1996, TSR had total sales of $40 million. And with that much uh, sales, they had no cash reserves. They had no money in the bank. They were totally spent. And then what happened was uh, their publisher, Random House, returned uh, a high percentage of the year's inventory, uh, which included unsold novels and dragon dice. Now, um, if you don't know how the business works, if, you don't, uh, if, a, if a bookstore doesn't sell um, all their inventory of a certain product, they can package that stuff up, and then they send it back to the publisher, and then they get a credit, and the publisher sends that back to the original producer. So that they had millions of dollars in unsold uh, credits they had to, that were billed to them, and they had no cash. So um, that's a problem. And since they're un now they're not able to pay their printing and shipping bills to the logistic company that handled their pre-pressed printing. So uh, warehousing and shipping... Uh, companies refused to do any more work for them. And since uh, the logistics company that had the production plates for key uh, products like their uh, Dungeon Master's Guide, Player's Handbook, and Monster Manual, they didn't, weren't printing them. They had the production plates, so there's no means of actually finding somebody else to print it for you because they've got your production plates. Uh, so now you can't make any more money. How are you going to... If you can't print books and you're a printing company, how, how are you going to generate revenue? Uh, to pay your bills. So now you're in a cash crunch. There's no option. There's no financial plan for you. And so Lorraine Williams, who was the CEO of uh, TSR at the time, sold the company to Wizards of the Coast in 1997. And I could do an entire video on Lorraine Williams, folks. Uh, that woman is the demon of, of, of RPGs, as far as I'm concerned. She ruined, she ruined TSR. Uh, and, I mean, she, she made rules... Uh, such as employees couldn't play RPGs in the game, in the company. <laughs> Is that insane? How are you going to play test stuff? But anyway, uh, in 1999, Wizards of the Coast was produced by Hasbro, and then 
um, it was pretty much understood that there was probably going to be a third edition of the game. Uh, in the interim, between 1997 and 19 and 2000, which was the release of uh, third edition of the game, Wizards of the Coast produced some quality reprints of the second edition core rule books with new artwork and added the um, and put out the skills and power supplements, which were really a precursor to third edition systems. Uh, but by this time, it was understood that the new edition of the game was coming, so they didn't sell very well. So. Anyway, uh, that's about all I have for this video because we're now getting into third edition uh, discussion. So until then, may your D20 roll true and game on.